Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for hopping on this call with us today. I am very excited to talk about guilds with Stefan, who many of you may already know from his YouTube videos, his social media accounts, or any resources that he provides because he gives so much information about permaculture, specifically with regards to orchard, um, understanding your site, and also um, guild establishment and maintenance. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Angela. Great, great to hear All the right, opportunity. So <laughs> absolutely. The pleasure is mine. So I understand you have a presentation you'd like to share with us. Uh, for anyone watching today, we're just going to ask that you hold your questions until the end. Perhaps something will come up in the presentation that you'll have answered. Um, but also, there's a hard cutoff time at 11, so we can't go over an hour. So I want to make sure Stefan has plenty of time to talk about what he wants to share. And then thereafter, we'll try to answer questions if possible. So, so Stefan, I'll open up the floor to you. Perfect. Yep. Let's just dive right in. Okay. So. Well, that's that's okay. We have you. You have your presentation at your end. I promise to stick to the script. Okay. So. So what was the first question again? So I just wanted to talk. Well, first, let's introduce uh, your farm, what it is that you're doing, what you're known for, what you're passionate about. The farm is, uh, we called it Miracle Farms, uh, just because, hey, the Holy Spirit said, you'll call it Miracle Farms. And I said, yes, sir, I will. <laughs> and so it started there. We bought a 12 acres in 1992. How old were you, Angela? Were you even around? <laughs> no. I was so, born in 1982. Okay. Well, there you go. So you're a young girl and we've mm -hmm. had many come by the farm over the years. We started as a U-Pick farm. It was a fully established orchard. We transitioned right away to organic and we operated it uh, organic for a few years and then we just stopped because we functioned as a you pick but a membership you pick so it was a different format and oh. so we did that finally to realize that you know the organic monoculture model doesn't work and so we it was a tough bullet but i decided you know we're gonna just pull out all the trees almost all the trees, and start over with a permaculture orchard design. And so as opposed to... Oh, I'm ahead. sorry. I just wanted to ask quickly, what was it that made you think that the monoculture wasn't working on your particular site? Well, I didn't have to think. I knew. I could see our biggest problem was we had caterpillars. Okay. And anytime you go against what nature's trying to do, monoculture is not nature's model. I mean, you look around, there are no monocultures. There are, you'll see a group of pines all the same, but it's not a whole area of acres of the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you try to go against the pattern in nature, you will, you'll come up against the nature's convincers, if you want to call them, that are trying to convince you to, eh, that's not the way to do it. And so for us, it was caterpillars and they were so bad that, you know, it just brings you to the point where you go, okay, I give up, you know, uh, for me, it wasn't an option of going because I could have sprayed with organic pesticides, but that was not the reason I started into having an orchard. So yeah. I realized, you know, something's not working. This is not a functioning ecosystem. It's broken the way it is. And so, yes, we tore out most of that orchard and replanted in a permaculture uh, design. Okay. That was a tough choice. But anyway, I'm glad now having done it and I've seen both sides. So I know, hey, I know how the monoculture works. And now I know how permaculture orchard model works using the idea of instead of a tree, we now have trios. So it's not one tree. And for us, one tree meant there was rows of 110 trees, all of the exact same clone. And no, that that won't work. Any, I can tell you, anybody trying that, you're going to be faced with some serious obstacles and or you'll need some serious inputs for that system to work. 
as opposed to now when we replanted, we never fertilized. So we haven't fertilized our orchard in 15 years. Actually, we didn't fertilize before, but we haven't fertilized in the uh, permaculture system. And we still get some insects, but the worst of them, the ones that were the worst are now, I'm glad to see them. Like you can't imagine what mm -hmm. a change that is to see the caterpillars, which used to devastate the orchard. When I say devastated, when you go into the orchard and you'll see a whole patch in June, when it should be full leaf and it looks like it's January, you know that there is a problem. You know that this is not working the way it should. And now when we see some of those caterpillars, I, I get excited. I say like, wow, look, there are some of these caterpillars. Because I know within three days, exactly, I used to put flags to mark, oh, I see a caterpillar here. And now I know they'll be gone in three days. It's inevitable every time. They'll start and they and the birds come in, the wasps come in, and they just clean them out. But that's the difference now having... I call them nature's allies. And it's just having a whole ecosystem that's working. Why? Because the pattern looks more like what nature does, which means it's not a monoculture. It's the closest thing to being a forest edge, which is really what an orchard is. An orchard isn't a forest. An orchard is an edge of a forest with a mixture of trees and all the animals that should be there being there. Almost See, all. We don't want deer. <laughs> you know, that's no, no, that's no good. So you attribute uh, going from what you consider, in a sense, failure, right, in the orchard, nothing thriving, you're, you're overwhelmed with caterpillars, to complete success. And you attribute that to getting away from monoculture, planting in trios, using gills, and you saw a resurgence in birds and insects that kept your caterpillar populations in check, correct? Yeah. Yep. The birds, we did help them because an orchard, you're pruning. If branches and trees are dying, usually you cut them. I don't now. I leave them. But you don't have a lot of big trees which can die and then become good habitat for birds that nest in holes. So, so we add... We add a series of nest boxes like this. And I mean, they really work. It's We have almost 300 right now in 12 acres. So that's a very high density, but that's because we get a high density of birds. And so we do use, uh, we use that a lot. And the wasps, we, we have done, but we don't even have to do anything. They come on their own. The only thing we have to do is when we see these big, you know, we get basketball size wasp nests and we just tape, we put fly, uh, caution tape around them so that people don't walk into those. And that's it. That's what we do. We always want to encourage them. We want to leave them. And we've never been stung. Uh, none of our members coming have been stung and we can have tens of thousands of wasps on the farm. But we know that if you leave them, and you don't go near their entrance, which is the only time they get aggressive is if you're bothering their coming and going. So I can stand like I can have this here as a big wasp nest with the hole here pointing towards you. And I've I've got pictures I, where I'm just I'm I'm right here looking at them coming and going. And it's like, aren't they going to sting you? No, because I'm not bothering their coming and going. I'm watching them. And you could see around the hole, all the soldiers, the guards that are there, they're guarding this. This is what they're guarding. If I'm here, I'm out of their path. They're not concerned. They're not coming this way. They're coming this way, right to the hole. And it's, if you just get that and you could live very peacefully with wasps and not have problems, they're really only bothered when it's like if you drove out onto your local airport and you went out on the runway with your car. It won't be long. I'm sure somebody will come out and get you out of there. Well, wasps do the same, but they're much faster at it. You've got about <laughs> three seconds. If you block this, first they'll hit you. They'll actually just fly into you and they'll tap you. It's like, you better move. And then it give you another two or three seconds. You don't move, they'll move you. So that's really 
the only the only way that they uh, they will be aggressive towards you. But yes, the guilds work. The allies building in and coming primarily because the guild. We would have some wasps in the past, and we had some birds. But when you put that diversity, especially in what I call the skeleton, it's the trees. Start with the trees. They're the foundation. That's like, you know, how do you stand up? Because you have a skeleton. It's not your muscles that hold you up. It's your skeleton. That's the, the structure. So your trees are that structure. Get that right. And I'd say you're 60 to 80% of all the benefits are done. Just mm. getting the idea of trios. And that that's really to me now, and I've seen it and I've seen it work for so many years. It's like, yeah, just get that right. And I'll, so many things work out. Then you start adding, but you could plant them all together. And actually, I prefer now that people plant, you know, if you're putting in a trio, put in the three trees. And what's the three trees? You have one of them is a nitrogen fixer. So what's not well there are trees just like if in your lawn you could have clover well there's trees that do the same role as clover which is fix nitrogen from the air into their roots and some of that nitrogen or some of the excess becomes available whether through pruning or just by root uh, the roots have actually meshed together and the idea of competition among plants, and uh, I don't, I don't have her book here, but there's a, a researcher, Dr. Suzanne Simard, um, had a book, Finding the Mother Trees, and mm. that was that for me that was transformational because now her research was looking at how in a forest do two species cooperate. And I do this because now you have one tree and one tree. And when their roots come together or they're joined by the mycelial network underground in the roots, those trees, and she was doing it um, with forestry because forestry was saying, no, we want pines and spruce. So all the leafy trees, we want to cut them down or put herbicide, just get rid of them. And she was able to show that if you have conifers, spruce, pine, whatever, fir, and then you have things like birch and maple. She was finding that once they join together, actually when they're really quite young, it happens when the trees are still young, that in the springtime, the conifers have their leaves. As soon as the sun's coming out in the spring, they're able to create energy. And that energy goes into the roots and they feed the deciduous trees. Wait a minute, that's two different species. Well, the conifers help the deciduous trees. Why would they help them? Because there's a time of the year when the when the deciduous trees get leafed out that they actually produce more energy than they need and they give back to the conifers. It was these kind of things where it's like, what? Yes, the forest is an ecosystem. The forest works as one organism. Maybe if you saw Avatar, you know, there was kind of, he didn't just, oh, let's just invent. No, he, he used those ideas from what the, from what science has found. And especially Dr. Simard, I mean, it's finding the mother tree, get that book because it really changes how you look at trees on your property. But I look at it as trees in the orchard. And now I've seen it. I mean, the trees, they're all joined together. They're, there's roots everywhere. It's like a forest and every tree is connected to the trees around it. So it's really quite amazing just what's going on with the trees. And then if you go further, then it's trees with the shrubs and trees with the perennials. And, and you know what? The idea of competition in a guild, to me, it's the exception that there is competition. Uh, the rule is there is a great deal of cooperation. The ones that I have seen that don't play nicely together are walnuts. I have I planted years ago. I planted a whole row. I wanted to have a like an alley when we drive in that that there would be this lane way of just tall walnuts, and it was like that's going to look sure. good. Sure. 
And it was right along the orchard. So it was the first trees to the orchard. And what I saw was for about eight years, no problem. The walnuts would grow and the, the fruit trees were right next to it and everybody was happy. And I said, no, I said, that, that idea of walnuts competing, no, it doesn't happen. Well, when the walnuts began to produce nuts, then they change. And there is, a, there, there is basically a tree just like a human has two phases, a juvenile stage where they're just growing and then a mature phase where they can reproduce. And when they begin to reproduce, there's different needs for the tree. And it says, okay, you know what? I, you've been here, but now I want a little more and I need a little more. And they have the means to remove trees near them. And that's what happens. So now the band from the walnuts is about 70 feet to 80 feet, it started like 10, 20, 30, and it's been progressing and the orchard's been disappearing uh, from the walnuts. And they do that by way of excreting that juglone into the soil, which yes. is what kills off those plants, right? And then that's right, when they take right. over sort of their territory. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. there are plants there. I did a video some years ago, this tree kills trees. And it's really showing that. And people put in great comments and there is some nice research about species that do well with them. So if you're going to have a walnut tree and you say, I want to put walnuts in, and they're great trees to have if you have the room because they become large trees, put in things like pawpaw, put in mulberries. Those are trees that do very well right next to the walnuts. So sure. you can have guilds with walnut that work well. Sure. So, you, you know, you talk about when you replanted uh, your orchard and you started working in these these groups of three, these trifectas for these trees, and then filling it in with, um, you know, understory like a shrub and then adding your perennials. What are some of the combinations, if you wouldn't mind sharing, that you use that have been successful at your farm? I just, and I, I really recommend people just try. But first of all, even for the choice of your trees, and and, and we could do this right now, People could take out their piece of paper or their phone and jot down, look at your property or think of your property and what trees could be a wild equivalent, what trees that are fruiting or producing nuts grow like weeds on your property. And that's that word weeds is very important because you say, well, oh yeah, you know, for us, it's grape and cherries. We're on a very sandy site and grapes do so well. I mean, we're pulling grapes all the time because they just, they're weedy. They're growing everywhere. But when we put the grapes we want, they do extremely well. And the same with cherries. So now we've been replanting uh, more and more sweet cherries in the orchard and sour cherries because they grow like weeds. Originally, we started with the trees that we had, which was apple, apple, pear, plum. But more and more, we're saying, why fight the site? Don't fight the site. Just go with it. The site is telling you this place, if you grow cherries and if you grow grapes, they will grow like weeds. How much effort do you put into your weeds? Oh, none. <laughs> exactly. So you, you don't have to you don't have to fertilize. You don't have to water. Right. You don't have to do anything. Your weeds are, are saying, thank you. I'm, I'm so happy here. This is fantastic site. And that's what you want. So what wild equivalent is a wild grapes? Maybe wild apples. Uh, maybe you have persimmon coming everywhere. Maybe you have uh, mulberries just coming up. Maybe it's brambles. Maybe it's blackberries. Whatever is on your site, you say, oh my gosh, this stuff, like we can't beat it back. That is what I love. You have that? Don't think of it as a nuisance. Think of it as they are indicating that if you plant a cultivated equivalent, maybe you have blackberry and they're so thorny, it's a thicket, you can't get in there. Okay, but that means that that's where the thicket is. How about if right over here, you put blackberries under whatever fruit trees or grow so well, grow like weeds. Start with that. Take two minutes for your audience to just, Write that down. What is it that grows like a weed? And if you don't have a property, 
think of a property you know, you're familiar with, and think, okay, yeah, what does grow there? And that means you're thinking, maybe the edge of the forest. Maybe it's along a hedgerow. What grows in that hedgerow? Maybe it's along a ditch. You know, if there's a ditch, there's an embankment, sometimes there's trees growing there. There are places where trees don't get disturbed so easily, and they're having a chance to get established and grow. And what is growing like a weed? Maybe we could see in the chat who's got some. You rest. know, while people are writing that down, one thing that was really interesting, and folks, you can use the chat or you can use the, the Q&A section that's at the bottom. Um, when we moved into the property, they showed us pictures of this particular area where it used to be hay fields. But now, and this this is this was twenty years later, it's dense with black walnut, juniper, autumn olive. There are a ton of wine berries, black cap raspberries, wild blackberries. There's ramps back there. Why would I eradicate that? You know, people say, why why didn't you clear that? Why didn't you make more pastures? That's a food forest that's taking place there that I I have nothing to do with. That established itself. I don't have to maintain it. I don't have to fertilize it. I have to do anything. I don't have to irrigate it. Of course it needs to stay there. And we walk through and we take the blackberries. You know, I, I don't eat nuts, but I'm not going to knock them down because the people after me can eat nuts and they, you know, harvest off the trees. So you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you more. It's all about what is in existence and wants to be on your site as opposed to yeah, maybe you want a peach tree and that's great. Go ahead and plant your peach tree. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that wants to be there. It's more about what what naturally thrives, right? That's right. Oh, yeah. that I like to say nothing beats easy. Now, imagine yeah. you put in trees based on what you're seeing on your site. You put in those trees. Are they going to grow well? You already see that they'll grow well. You say, well, yeah, but I want to plant them down there at the bottom. Maybe down there, they're not growing. Yeah. So that's a difference. But if you stay on that hillside with the same exposure to the sun, you can be almost guaranteed that those trees will do extremely well because their wild equivalent <laughs> is telling you that, yes, I guarantee your soil is pretty high pH to have some yeah. of those trees yes. come in. And so that's that's, to me, that's the easiest because you can try to project what will grow here no guarantee you'll know but when you look what is indicating what will grow there then if you know well usually with that this grows like ramps are growing well ramps usually grow where there's some maple so even your, your yes. site probably was maple because they're a great indicator growing usually for us under sugar maple and so on so it's it's the more pieces you can put together, the easier it becomes. I would say your best bet for that is just mow paths. Exactly. That's, That's exactly all you have to do. Like, oh, why yeah, should you plant path? them? Just give access. And yeah. by mowing, you'll prevent, I mean, maybe you have a clump of uh, blackberries. Mow one side, mow the other side fairly close. They're going to try to spread there. But now you have perfect access and like, what do you have to do? That's exactly what we've done is we have our paths and we also use them as horse trails, which, you know, that brings in manure and whatnot. But regardless, yes, there's these mode trails. And sure enough, those berries climb up on either side. You walk through. I don't I don't need to grow raspberries. Wine berries, I know they're not the same, but I don't need to plant them. I have them in abundance. I get that similar flavor. Blackberries, you know, we have those in abundance. How much that. work have they been? <laughs> Nothing. They're just mowing, just, you know, mow yeah. once once every couple of weeks, keep those paths in shape and we're good. It's incredible. And now if you wanted to in those areas, you can put in a tree that will be pretty big, that mm -hmm. will grow above those berries. And, and gradually, will the berries get less? Yes, but you don't have to put trees in, in such a density that they will shade them all out. Sure. And... Uh, berries have, a, especially the, all those cane fruit, they have the ability to migrate. So if there's too much shade here, they'll, they will grow over here now. They'll be further in the sun. And it, so, like, some people make it very complicated. And, you know, I want to grow this. Yeah, you may try. And you know what? 
I've tried everything. And some of them, oh, this year we're going to have peaches. It will be great. Then winter comes along and we get, we hit, here we hit minus 30 Celsius, which is minus 40 is the same. It's cold. I mean, we, we, cold. Get, we get very cold here and it'll just kill peaches right to the root. Right. I mean, everything just dries right up. It's too cold for peaches. They'll grow for a few years. Like this year was very mild. They'll be fine. They'll flower this year but they have to grow three years before the flowers. So you have to have three years of cold that is not as cold as they take about minus 25. Yeah, we usually get colder than that. So, but, you know, I think one thing that's also worth pointing out in case folks might not be familiar is not only are these plants that are sort of native, quote unquote, to your site, not only are they less maintenance and, and they take less work to establish, and maybe they withstand your weather patterns better, right, than something that you might bring in. But they also already have an innate relationship with wildlife and insects. So by that, I mean, and obviously I want your confirmation, they are not going to fall to the same pest pressure as that peach tree that we just mentioned, because that is not sort of, again, I don't like the term native, but quote unquote, that is not the originally intended plant or native plant to that space, right? And plants, everything has a season. To everything, yeah. there's a season. So for plants, it's the same. You, perhaps you plant plums. You say, oh, I like plums or plums are growing wild on your property. But plums are a pioneer. Plums are what come in into an open field and the seed falls, the, whether it's a blue jay or something, they bring the, and they drop the seed falls and you'll get a plum tree. But plums will live and do very well for that first 10, 15, maybe 20 years. By then, chances are other trees have come in. And unless you keep clearing around the plum, the plum doesn't like being shaded out. It will just go downhill. So yes, uh, Insects disease, my, uh, my, my, one of my mentors, Sir Albert Howard, here's a great book. If you want to get read down. really a classic, The Soil and Health, Sir Albert Howard, he, his, one of his favorite things, uh, his, one of his quotes that I liked the best was he said, pests uh, and disease are not the problem. We should, they should be regarded as our professors sent free by nature to put our house in order. So you say, oh, I have this pest. You know, I'm trying to grow peaches on that thing and it's not working well. I got all these flies and I got this. And that. It's not the problem of the peach. There's some other reason that's the problem. It could be the cultivar because there's within peach, there are so many, uh, I mean, I don't know how many in the States, but I know when I was teaching in France, they had a collection of 900 cultivars just of peaches. Wow. Like there's so many varieties and like there's a lot. And in that, there's a huge range in how tolerant to disease they are. There's sure. a big, there's naturally a big range. So if you have an insect or a disease, or if you have a weed, the weed or the insect or the disease, it isn't the problem. The problem is there's something else. And insects, for example, certain insects and fruit trees, very often it's drainage. Mm. If you dug down, chances are, maybe you say, yeah, but you know, down there near the bottom land, there's a bottom, it, the soil is so good there, it's beautiful. Yes, the soil is beautiful, but it's a bottom land. Bottom lands are floodplains historically. Fruit trees don't, most fruit trees don't like growing in a floodplain. There are many trees that do. You'll get basswood, you'll get elm, you'll get silver maples. There's a whole range of trees, you know, that love that. Cottonwood will grow there, willows will grow there, ash will grow there, but not apples. Naturally, the apples are on the hillside above the floodplain. They're up here, not down here. Seeds are falling there. But the trees, not they may germinate, but then in the summertime, when you have a flood that lasts for a week, yeah, that fruit tree says, no, this ain't for me. And it just dies because it can't tolerate being 
having its roots asphyxiated, no oxygen because there's water. They don't, they don't live in those conditions. Other trees do, but not those. So most often fruit trees, when certain insects are really being a pest, not caterpillars, but a lot of other ones, uh, the reason is your tree is doesn't have a deep enough soil until you hit the water table. So hmm. I always recommend people just get your shovel out, go dig some holes. You want to put trees here? Dig some holes. If you can go four feet down, especially in the spring, but it's normal for in the spring, the, uh, in our area, the snow is melting, the water table is higher, and then it goes down. But if you could dig four feet, especially in the summer, at least the time when the trees are growing, so from May till October, if you could dig down and you get four feet where there's no water in the hole, that's already a great chance that that site is going to be good. Why? You'll avoid problems. I only can go down two feet. Well, dig some more. But you say, I only have this spot. Okay, well, then what you have to do is you have to raise the soil. And even commercial orchards in some areas do that. It's, it's just a cut and fill. So you imagine you're going to put rows. So here will be your two rows. In between the rows, you take the soil down by a foot and you put that soil on the mound. So you actually, for the mound, because it's a smaller area than what the aisle is, you can actually go up two feet. You only had two feet to the water table, but now you have with the two extra feet of soil, you got four feet. So you're creating a berm. You're putting a berm. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a lot more work than having the exact right place. But they do that even though it costs them a lot because they know that otherwise certain things will be, you don't understand how expensive it is to spray an acre with a pesticide. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there are products that cost as much as for us, it's $500 per hectare in our area, which is two and a half acres. So it's like $250 an acre to spray your trees. And these things, usually you'll have to spray them every year. Why? Because your soil doesn't have enough depth. So choosing the right site, whether it's water drainage and air drainage. I've consulted with people and it's like the first thing I look, I go, you want to put the orchard there? That's going to be a disaster. Like yeah. it'll, it'll be a disaster because your air drainage, which means the ability for the air, especially if you're in, if you're in flatland, that's a whole different thing. You don't have good air drainage, but if you're on a slope, that's already much better. But there are places where if your slope, the air can't drain out, maybe you're putting, and for that person, the, the example was they wanted to put an orchard, let's say here, but just below was a whole forest, large forest with a big dense edge. Well, what would happen is the cold air would come down the mountain and fill up that space along the edge of the forest. And all those trees in the spring would frost. Mm. Maybe not every year, but at least every second or third year. Well, that's a lot of money and time going into putting your trees in and you only get a crop maybe once every three years. So all these things, it's, it's so much better to prevent problems than to actually have to intervene and try to repair. If you have to spray, you're intervening. If yeah. you have to put in wind turbines because, you know, you're, you're, you're getting frosted, you're having to intervene. So think of how do I avoid these, the right setup. And I mean, go into depth in that. And we have a master class. And I mean, I go through all the, all the possible things that you'll have as problems in selecting your site. Boy, that's so important. If you can avoid so many things just by saying, I, I even suggested to people, look, wh what you want to do, where you want to do it, won't, won't give you an easy orchard. That's guaranteed. You can have those trees. You can have them. They may not produce every year. There'll be, there'll be insect problems. There'll be so many problems which you could avoid if you have the right site. And so in some cases, it's simpler to sell and buy another property. And it just depends to what level you want to do this. But sure. every area and what you observed on your property, those are easy. Nothing beats easy. I mean, if you've got plants that will grow like weeds, 
that is, you should say, oh my gosh, that is fantastic. That means if I grow that equivalent, I have, it's going to be so easy. It's going to be crazy. I agree. One thing that you touched on that I think a lot of folks get really frustrated with is when you do have to intervene with caterpillars. And anytime I post something about organic or you know the term that people have, are starting to use better than organic apples, better than organic produce, where rather than just use organic sprays, we're going and, and we're using these permaculture and these preventative methods. But people are always saying, I'm still running into problems with caterpillars. And I have, I have, ish, I have caterpillars. I think though, one thing, and I, I do want to talk about your methods for not eradicating, but coexisting with and sort of lowering their populations. I want to talk about how you do that. Because I think one thing that people are so frustrated with is they don't understand bringing in birdhouses, right? And, and, and that, but that it also takes time and none of these things are going to change overnight. So can we talk a little bit about coddling moths and apple maggots? Cause I know that those are the big ones that people hate. Yeah, actually those are, those are the two that still give us problems. So I worked on this for 20 years, developing this simple, simple trap. I mean, it's so, it, I love simple. Why? Yeah. Because if it's simple, you know what? It it works very easily. And this is, we tried, this is about the 10th version of these traps we have. And now I can say, I mean, these things, they work. It's a, it's a hard plexiglass. I mean, this is plexiglass. And in this case, we sprayed a red dot on it. It's so simple, you know, back and front. It's flat. So you have to put them in the tree and, and we put one per trio just because we put them on through the whole orchard. Sure. But if you're, if you have two trees, put three of these on a tree. And I mean, a coddling, uh, this is for apple maggot fly An apple maggot fly. We've had it where we bought apples. We had 4,000 trees and we bought apples to eat because all our apples were for juice. Like they, they, they were all infested with these. Yeah. So I know what that's like, yeah. but with these traps now, and I, the reason we, I mean, it took us years to develop this, but it's expensive to buy something that will do a lot of trees. And so I show people how to make these because you could, we sell them, but you can make them. They're really not that difficult if you're going to make a lot. And, and we just wrap them with one layer of cellophane or it's cling wrap. And then we put a uh, tree tangle foot on and it's, it's a dirty job. I guarantee you, it is. you wear clothes that it's the last time you want to wear it because that stuff is <laughs> sticky, but it works. So you put this on a tree, on a branch, you wrap it there. You want to wrap it tight so it doesn't move. And then once you put the tangle foot, the apple maggot fly coming in, it sees, and this there's a reason why it's red on yellow. It's McDonald's uh, design graphics. It's the <laughs> highest contrast. And so the fly's coming from a distance, and it comes because it smells the apples in the tree. And we put these, and we've tested them, and we put them on the east side because our dominant wind is from the west. So mm. the flies come from the east 10 times more than they come from any other direction. So we put them on every tree uh, that in the trio, we'll put them on the east side. So the fly's coming, it's coming for the smell and it sees, oh, here's a ripe apple, but it's a time when there's no apples ripe, it's early. And they come in and they get like, well, you'll see these covered with a bunch of flies. You don't want them covered because that's got, you got a lot of pressure, but that's how they work. So that's for the, and these things really, really work very simple. And Stefan, if I can ask real quick, when would you suggest folks hang those after leaf set or grab fruit set? When do you typically suggest that they yeah, put them? We out? have it in our area. We're Southern Quebec in Canada. We put them around between the 24th of June and July 1st, like that week, okay. depending on the year. But if you're thinking anywhere after mid June, you don't want it too early because other insects do get caught in it and you don't want to have to re-glue them. But 
if you go to your extension uh, system, they'll tell you, they'll have scouting reports as to when Apple maggot flies are spotted in your mm. area. And basically you want to have it out at around the time where the first flies start to emerge. And it, the if you want to do preventative, you make sure you pick up all those fruit under your tree. So you would just make sure your horses go under your trees and eat every apple that falls. I'm and that's happy. great. They love apples. Yeah. <laughs> and so they'll clean up. You want them to clean up. The best quality fruit we had when we had the organic orchard was when we had a hundred sheep rotating through the orchard. Mm -hmm. So we would rotate them. And then when we say, okay, that area, we're going to, we're going to be picking. We wait till we pick and then we put the sheep in and they just clean it out. I mean, sheep do better than any human picker because they can smell and grass that high. They'll smell there's an apple in there and they'll go get it. Mm. So when they picked everything, there's no fly that completes its cycle because you have an apple. It gets, there's apple maggot flies in there. Either you pick it or if it falls, if you wait Sometimes it's as little as just a few days. The larvae that's in the apple will come out of the apple, go right in the ground. Next year, you have perfect setup. It'll just come out and in the tree it goes. This one is the one for coddling moth. So this is simply an oil container. You have them as quart containers of oil. We just get them from the garage and we make these holes, small holes, quarter inch holes all around. And we put in about one to two inches of a uh, mixture of 50% molasses and 50% water. And if it's really hot, you will have to recharge the water because the water evaporates, but the molasses stays. And if you leave it evaporate too much, they can actually walk on the molasses and not get trapped. So huh. the coddling moths smell the molasses fermenting and this, this will ferment. So they'll smell that, that attracts them just like they're attracted to beer, any of the fermenting yeasts basically and they'll come in in one of these holes and it, this works it's so simple and if you put two or three of these and two or three of the other ones you still may get some fruit but we've had as little as three percent damage with this which is the in our area it's the acceptable amount with pesticides so it's like no pesticides and very little insect damage that's incredible. And when do you suggest people put out the coddling moth? Oh, yeah, these, uh, you want to put them at about the petal fall. So oh. wait a minute, is that it? Yeah. So this will go first. This yes, will go this, this goes early. You could yeah. put it up when it's in full bloom, because don't worry, there aren't many uh, pollinating insects, like people say, oh, well, bees, no, bees don't, they don't care for the smell of molasses, but the coddling moth does. So put them in when your trees are in bloom and it's when the petals fall. Yeah. You want to get them in when there's bloom, because when the petals fall, that's the start of coddling moth. And they can have two or even three generations. If you're further South, you're where? Uh, South New Carolina? Jersey. New, New Jersey. Jersey. Mm -hmm. So you probably have two full cycles, some years, three. And so you put them Make sure there's enough liquid and just keep them there until after you harvest your fruit. It's fascinating. I know that that's going to be so helpful for so many people. Um, Do we take questions? I see we have 10 minutes left. We have 10 minutes. Well, let me just ask you a quick question. Can guilds work anywhere? Yes, but that's the typical permaculture answer. You have to be specific to the area. Yeah. So I can tell you, you know, here is what works here. If you're in an arid climate, if you're in Utah or something, it's a very different selection of trees. So yes, but adapted to your area, maybe even spacing adapted. You don't have that much water. So maybe space your trees further apart. And yes, for every area, I'd say if you're really in an arid climate, please check out Jeff Lawton's channel. He has a project in Jordan that is drier than any dry area. Mm. It's incredible. And he's got a whole series of videos from his Jordan greening the desert site. If you look, you can't believe what that site looked like. It was basically pickaxe 
breaking up rock to create a bit of soil. It's just not soil. It was just rock dust. Really? And what they did to that site. And now it's like an, it's an oasis. It's incredible. If, if you're in a subtropical, I'd say, look at Jeff's Australian project. Look at Pete Canaris, K-A-N-A-R-I-S. He's got great examples in Florida, what works. If you're in a tropical environment, Ernst Gotch, G-O-T-S-C-H. He's got incredible example of, he calls it syntropic agroforestry. Uh, check out Byron Groves. He's in New Zealand and he's one of Ernst's students and he's doing great things too. There are mm. examples. Look up permaculture orchard. Look up food forest. Look up forest garden. Look up uh, syntropic agroforestry. Look up silvopasture if you want animals. Those are all things you want to look in your area. What's adapted? What people have done? What examples? What strategies? It's just tweaking and adapting. But everybody who's got projects that are like that all use guilds. And guilds are trees, shrubs, sometimes several layers of shrubs, sometimes several layers of trees, and then all kinds of perennials, ground cover, root plants. Guilds absolutely work. Why? Because if you go to a forest, if you go to a, just look what is growing naturally in that pattern. That's why I said ramps. You know, for us yeah. here, ramps are in in uh, sugar maple bushes. It's ramps. You know, yeah. these there are natural associations of plants, uh, and that's what you want to copy. Grow what grows like weeds. You'll never you'll never regret growing this. That if it's a, like a weed, because you'll go like, how much work do you spend on yours? No, you just mow. No, you just mow your pads and you're done. You're done. <laughs> All right, let's try to answer a few questions real quick. And again, uh, Zoom is going to cut us off right at 11. Um, okay, I have 10 old pecan trees planted by the original owners. I have cedar and juniper starting to crowd them out. What can I plant to help these old trees? Pecans out of our area, but... Um... I would say go to, ideally, if you can find an abandoned pecan orchard and go see what comes up naturally there and try to copy that. Uh, that would be, you do want to, you know, I've been on the monoculture route, even 10 trees is starting to be what other trees would naturally grow with them. And it just will make it work better as a system. So copy mm -hmm. what is working in your area if you can. That's always a good strategy. Eliza asks, does the container for the coddling moth need to be opaque? Uh, I, no, but we can't. I've never seen a non-opaque. And, and I've tried lots of types of container. And there's a reason we use oil containers because they don't degrade in the sun. I mean, we put some of these containers, we've had them for 10 years. And we've had other containers we tried. Anything in the kitchen that you would put in is not UV stable and they won't last one season and the plastic will fall apart and then you'll have plastic debris all over. So yes, just get oil containers. They are UV stable. They work. The black ones actually work the best. The gold and yellow are at the other end. They, I don't find them working as well. There's a reason the black gets warmer and it gives off more odor it just, it works. So if That's you can get black oil containers, they really work. Uh, Janine says, you mentioned a trio of trees. Your first was a nitrogen fixer. What are your other two? Uh, it could be nitrogen fruit fruit. It could be nitrogen fruit nut. It could be nitrogen nut nut. So whatever combination, whatever works in your area, that's why I look on your property. And then what nitrogen fixer, and there's a whole range of trees. It could be shrubs uh, that will fix nitrogen as a tree or a shrub. And like the combinations are, there's huge amount of, com we did this years, 10 years ago already. Um, we put this film out. That's and excellent. It's, if you have, I mean, it's a great one because in two hours and we show there's lists of plants and You'll get so many ideas. It's so dense. 
Like you really have to watch it more than once because it's a, although it was a film, a documentary, it's more of a mini course to help people who want to get started. You could get that. I mean, you can get it from the site permacultureorchard.com or uh, even through Amazon. It was a- I've watched it multiple times myself. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, the rest here are just a lot of wonderful comments. People are happy with the information. They love what you're doing. Harms nothing, provides shelter. Um, what do you want folks to know about you before we head out here? YouTube. Uh, yeah, you know, YouTube. YouTube, YouTube is, has been very useful. Start there. I mean, start, start with the film. If you say, you know, I, I want to learn a lot, just get the film. I think it's, you could get it for under 20 bucks, even 10, if you get uh, that YouTube. If you're more advanced, if you say, yeah, I want to put in more trees and go to our uh, masterclass website, permaculture.study, and you can start any of the courses for free. There, there's over 26 hours of video. So I can tell you it's basically my life's work. Everything I've learned, I've poured into that course and we're updating it all the time. It's a great, it's, it's not free, but it's, if you're thinking of doing this and you're going to invest because it's easy to invest a thousand dollars into a few trees, like you won't get a lot for a thousand. Uh, but if you're putting in thousands of dollars, I'd say, you know, invest in your education that you can always take with you. Even if you find, you know what, I really have to move sites because unfortunately that's sometimes the only conclusion is that where we are is really not suited to what we want to do. Sure. Stefan, you're such an inspiration to me. I learned so much from you. Thank you so much for being here today. I am honored to have had the opportunity to chat with you. I really appreciate your time. Oh, you're and welcome. For anyone watching today, if you'd like to watch this again, I suggest you do to take notes. I'm going to be posting this to YouTube. Um, so there will be a replay of this later next week. Thank you again so much, Stefan. And thank you for every to everyone who attended. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. All right.